So now let's get on to stellar evolution. Um, first of all, stars are going to change in their brightness and their temperature as they evolve. And we can plot that on the HR diagram. So here I've got a couple of schematics, stars that are forming. So you've got high mass stars, and where they start and where they end on the main sequence. Low mass stars, where they start and where they end on the main sequence. Um, we kind of talked about this to some extent when we talked about formation of the solar system. This is the collapse of a cloud, and as it gets hotter and hotter, it glows in the infrared, and then it will grow, glow in the red, and eventually it becomes a star. We're not going to go into that anymore, but we will get into what happens after the main sequence and during the main sequence. So, let's start with the main sequence. Just like all main sequence stars, the common thing is that they are all burning hydrogen in their cores. And so, as they're uh, progressing through their main sequence lifetime, the hydrogen core is getting used up and the core is filling with helium. And so what you're getting is a change in the mass fraction. So here I've got the mass fraction um, was 75% hydrogen and it's now much lower in the core, but the outer region where you don't have any burning going on has just stayed the same. Likewise here, it's 25%, it was 25% helium and it's now around 60% helium. Now, this leads to some interesting progressions in the surface properties of the sun. Uh, for a start, every time you do a reaction to make helium, you're changing the number of particles. You're going from four hydrogens to one helium. You have less particles in the core. So the pressure drops. Remember that the pressure is related to the number, of, the number density of particles. The number density is going down. And so the core contracts because gravity is pulling in, but pressure is not as great. Remember, we need hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, but if you contract, you're converting gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy, and so it gets hotter and denser. As it gets hotter, then you actually will cause more reactions. The reactions will go faster, so you make more light, and so you actually heat the outer envelope that's not doing any fusion, and so it causes those outer regions to expand, and the radius increases. Likewise, because you have an increase in the rate of fusion, there is more energy produced, so the luminosity increases. So both the radius and the luminosity are going up. And so for the sun, it's already, it's already increased from um, its original state as a new, newly born star by about 40% in luminosity and about 6% in radius. And we can use this to work out what its temperature should be, should have been. Um, remember that there's a simple relationship. If we've got the radius, um, and we've got the luminosity, we can work out the temperature. So I'm just going to rearrange this equation to get it in terms of temperature. And then I get um, that we put in, it was, it's gone up by 40%, so it's 1.4. It's gone up in radius by 6%, so it's 1.6. So its original radius was 0.95, what it is now. So it's increased by about 5%. The initial temperature would have been a few hundred degrees less. It's not a huge change, but it's changing, and it's changing all the time. Okay, and this is true for all stars in the main sequence. So we actually have what's called the zero age main sequence, sometimes called ZAMS, because we love our acronyms. And so here you've got zero age main sequence, and here you've got it's still a main sequence star when it's in this zone, but um, it's not yet off the main sequence. It's just changed because of the change in the number of particles. And this is just another view of that, because I couldn't decide which one I liked better. Okay, and so remember, we talked about how the lifetime on the main sequence depends on the luminosity and the mass. So 25 solar masses, 80,000 solar luminosities, is only going to last 3 million years. Whereas a solar mass star lasts, lasts 10, 10 billion years, and um, a half solar mass star lasts 0.2 trillion years. And this is just another view of that in terms of spectral type. Okay? And remember, we've got the amount of energy we have available is given by m, and the luminosity goes as m to the 3 halves. So remember that our lifetime is 1 over m to the 2.5. We looked at that when we were talking about um, stellar masses. And so massive stars have very short lives. You can see there the O star is only going to live for 1 million years, and the B star is about 10 million years. Um, and, and the very low mass stars have very long lives. Now, eventually the star is going to run out of fuel in its core. 
And at that point, it stops making any energy. It can't do the E equals MC squared thing anymore because there's no more hydrogen to use. And so it, gravity will win, and this will be the beginning of the end for the star. Now, if you've got a high-mass star, eventually it will explode, and we'll get into that later. Um, and here you can, we already saw this in the, uh, when we talked about supernovae as standard candles. Um, this one is also a supernova remnant. It's what's left over after it exploded. And then this is one of the most famous supernova remnants. So there's actually the remains of the star where it says crab pulsar. Um, but all of that other stuff is what was part of the star once and exploded out. And this one was actually witnessed um, almost a thousand years ago in China. But even less massive stars throw off material and they dry, although they die in a less dramatic way, they still produce fairly attractive corpses. And so it's kind of nice to, to learn about these as well. Plus, they remember that low mass stars are much more abundant than high mass stars. Remember our distribution, our census of the um, HR diagram? And so they're actually really important, even though they're not as exotic. Um, and so this one is called the Helix Nebula, and it's one of the um, most famous uh, remnants of a sun like star, which is the Egg Nebula. And we'll look at those later. So here I've got the schematic for some low mass stars. So we've got the end of hydrogen fusion. And what happens next is they become red giants. But why do they become red giants? Well, we'll go through all of the different steps. This is kind of a guide for where we're going. But for this section, we're just going to go from the main sequence, the end of the main sequence, up to becoming a fully fledged red giant and the end of the red giant with the helium flash. So what happens is that you have um, the expansion of the star because you have a core that's made of helium, but you can't fuse the helium. The helium doesn't stick together very well. So it's just collapsing under gravity. It's got no uh, energy source. But because it's collapsing, it drags along some of the unburned material outside of it. You've still got hydrogen around the core, and that also collapses in. But because it collapses in, it heats up and can fuse because it's easier to fuse he hydrogen. And so you get a shell of hydrogen burning. So here you can see you've got this helium core. It's all collapsing in. You've got this hydrogen shell that collapsed in a little, and it's now fusing, and it's fusing really fast. And so it's heating this outer layer, and this outer layer then expands, and that's what gives us a red giant. And it may expand beyond the Earth's orbit. That's actually unlikely in the first red giant phase. We'll get on to that. This is kind of a, another way of looking at this. So here we've got the fuel runs out the outward pressure in the core drops, and so gravity makes it squish. Because it squishes, you get uh, production of helium from hydrogen fusion in a shell around the core, which puts energy into the rest of the star, which causes it to expand. But if it expands, then the surface area has to cool down. OK, and so we've got the end of fusion, and we're going to look at this path as it goes up to the red giant phase. So basically, we're going to worry about stars from about 1 to 8 solar masses. Um, actually, even between 0.08 and 8 solar masses, they're going to behave the same way uh, for the starting point. Um, so just to remind you, we've got core hydrogens run out. It's all made into helium. There's no more energy production. There's no more uh, pressure gravity balance, and so gravity wins. The core shrinks and heats up. A shell of hydrogen gas around the helium core also shrinks and heats up, and so you get fusion of that hydrogen, which inputs energy into the outer layers and causes it to expand and cool, and we have a red giant. OK, and this is showing you what it looks like in this phase. So we've got, it's in this phase here. It is expanding and uh, getting brighter and brighter as this continues to collapse, and we get more and more hydrogen uh, burning faster and faster. You still have most of the star not doing anything, and the inner region is what's called helium ash. That is to say, it's helium, and it's shrinking, and it's not able to fuse yet. OK, but then eventually we get this helium flash that's appeared on a few of these diagrams. Um, and so we need to talk about what that is. So remember, the core is contracting. It's getting hotter and hotter because you're converting gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. Eventually, you get to about 100 million Kelvin. And at that point, you can start fusing 
helium. And basically it does it by what's called the triple alpha. A helium nucleus is basically an alpha particle, and so if you take three of them and you stick them together, you get carbon. Um, we know we can stick heliums together because it's part of the PP chains, so why is it that we need higher temperatures to make the triple alpha process work? Well, basically in this case, you're sticking two heliums together to get a beryllium, and then you have to stick another helium on before that beryllium can fall apart because it's unstable. And so you have to overcome a higher coulomb barrier and you have to do it fast. Um, uh, but once you ignite a little bit, it spreads through the core very fast. And that's why it's called a helium flash. But why does that happen? Well, it's because the center of the star gets to the point where it's been compressed so much that it no longer behaves as an ideal gas. It has become what's known as degenerate. So I'm going to have to explain what I mean by degenerate. Oh, and this is just a view graph of, so I've got two heliums, I bring them together, I get a beryllium. But unless I add the next one pretty fast, then the beryllium will actually go backwards into two heliums. But if I can add another beryllium fast, then I get a carbon-12. Okay, so let's talk about degenerate matter. Um, so remember, we've got no thermal pressure because we're not making anything. And so it actually becomes this new state um, of matter, which is where the electrons are as close together as they can possibly get. And why is this? Um, well, it has to do with the uh, Pauli exclusion principle. And because there is this thing called the Pauli exclusion principle, um, it means that you cannot arbitrarily put electrons together. They can only be a certain distance apart. So, what it actually says is that two, uh, no two identical Fermi particles can exist in the same space. That's what the Pauli exclusion principle says. Um, what is a Fermi particle? Well, it's any particle that has a spin of n over 2 where n is a, an odd number. So electrons, protons, neutrons are all fermions. Um, but we also have to worry about what we mean by the same space. What it really means is they can't have the same, they can't be in the same space and have the same momentum. So it's kind of taking some Heisenberg in there as well. Um, so basically you cannot have the same speed and have the same position. So if you have different speeds, that's fine. But that means that in a given gas, you have a distribution of speeds. You can't arbitrarily stick them closer together um, unless you give them more options of speed because their masses are going to be the same. And so you run out of space to fit them in. And so, um, and what it is is that you can only put them, put them together as uh, basically h cubed. Okay. Um, you can actually put two together. This is why you get electronic structure, why electronic orbitals have pairs of electrons in them, because you can put them spin up and spin down. And uh, that has to do with them having this spin a half. Um, but it means that when you collapse your core of your star, you can actually get the electrons close enough together. They can't get any closer. And that's what happens when the star starts to collapse its core. It's collapsing its core, and eventually they just get so close together that they repel each other and can no longer collapse. And so you get what's called degeneracy pressure. Um, and the most efficient way to be packed in is to be basically in a crystal lattice, because that's how close you can get them without there being anywhere else for them to go. And so it behaves like a conductor. It behaves like a solid. And so what happens is that as soon as you can ignite the uh, helium burning in one place, the energy is transmitted through this crystal lattice to the rest of the core very rapidly. And so what we get is a flash. Turns out that degeneracy is also important in other places like white dwarfs, and we'll come to that as we get to white dwarfs. So we've got uh, a core that's made of ordinary gas, and if the ignition starts, then you know, you're going to get the core expanding. Remember that you've got, if, you, if you heat up a gas, it will expand if it's an ideal gas. A degenerate gas doesn't do that, and so uh, to a, some degree, and we can get into those details in class, but um, if, you, if you increase the temperature enough, you actually give it enough different speeds that it can have, and it can overcome degeneracy, and that, so that's different, then it can expand. Um, but what, you can also, what you're also doing is increasing the rate of the triple alpha um, reaction, and so at some temperature, the gas will become non-degenerate. So, and that's to do with the amount of 
um, fusion that you can actually do. So you can have something, it switches on, and then as soon as it's switched on, it will propagate that energy, and now it's got a source of energy, and it will get to a very high temperature very fast, and so then the core will expand. And it actually cools down just a little bit. It won't switch off, but it will cool down just a little bit, and that causes a reorganization, and so actually the star goes into what's known as a quiescent core um, helium burning phase and it's kind of like a second main sequence but it's brighter and that is the end of the first red giant phase and that's pretty much where we're going to get to in this section so what we just had is we so at this point when you've got the helium burning switches on you're going to have that helium switches on there you can have helium burning in there and you've got the hydrogen burning as well um, the helium is actually dumping stuff onto uh, sorry the hydrogen burning is dumping energy and helium onto the core all the time and so it gets hotter and hotter and so even though it can't make its own energy it can eventually be ignited even though it's not collapsing to get that energy it's getting it from the hydrogen burning shell and then we get the switching on of the helium burning and that's what we're going to get to for now we'll come to what happens next in the next segment <laughs>